Good morning. I want to welcome you uh, today to another gathering of Lebanon Baptist Church. As you're making your way uh, to your seats, I uh, want to uh, welcome those of you who are here today, particularly those who are visiting for the first time or the first time in a long time. Uh, if that happens to be the case, if, uh, particularly if you're interested in looking, you're looking for a new church body, uh, let me invite you. There's some welcome cards on the seats in front of you. Uh, you, you would want to fill one of those out and just drop it in our offering plate that will be passed in a little bit. That will at least give us a little bit of your contact info and we will try to reach out to you and kind of just give you some more information about the church. Uh, we're glad that you're here today and uh, uh, excited of what's in store for our service. Uh, to begin with, just a few announcements in reference to church life. Uh, just want to remind uh, our church family that tonight we have a partnership meeting. All of you who are members of Lebanon Baptist Church, we uh, would love for you uh, to be here this evening as we just uh, give you an update on what's going on within our uh, church family. Other things going on with our church, next Sunday is kind of the opening growth group uh, for this uh, winter and spring. Uh, we as a church really encourage you, if you're a member, to be a part of three groups. One would be the big group, which is our congregation that meets every Sunday morning. But we also encourage you to get into a medium-sized group, which is our life stage classes. And uh, you get to know some other people uh, within a, a smaller context. And then the final uh, even subset to that is that you'd get into a small group. These are people that you get to know really on a uh, personal name basis and that you can live out the one another's with. And so if you're interested in finding out more about how to get into one, stop by the Hospitality Center afterwards. Uh, ladies, just a reminder as well of a uh, special uh, ladies workshop on the Bible, on biblical theology. You've been hearing about that uh, in, the, in the bulletin and on the announcements. So if you haven't signed up for that, let me encourage you to do so. Uh, missions conference, it's coming a little earlier this year in February uh, because of kind of the school breaks uh, and kind of the end of February. And so make sure you mark your calendar for that. There's lots of areas in which we need help and volunteers. Uh, don't just come to the missions conference, participate in it and be a part. And so if you're looking for something that you can do to serve the body with that, Stop by the Hospitality Center afterwards and they'll give you some ideas for that. And the final announcements uh, in reference to communication boxes. Many of you, uh, some of you still have Christmas cards in there. And so if you're a member or just a regular attender and uh, you don't know about these, these are boxes in our kind of our intersection of our church. Look uh, for your, uh, the letter of your last name. And just check and see if you have any of those. That'll help clear those things out uh, to start a new year. Well, today we have a special service planned. Uh, of course, the primary thing is that we always come here to worship Jesus. He is what it's all about. But we are going to be worshiping Jesus as we set apart for gospel ministry. Our members, in a little bit, will have an opportunity to affirm and to set apart as he leads his family on this assignment. And so the theme of our service today is to declare the glory of God to the nations. You know what, we live in a world in which God's glory has been attacked. It has been clouded over by the prince of the power of the air, by those who've rebelled against him. You and I, who now know Christ as our Savior and have placed our faith in him, we have been called to hold back that corruption and once again to display God's glory by preaching his name among the nations. And so today, would you join me as I uh, ask God to come down. Of course, he's here, but we are going to ask him to work in our lives today and help us to once again, understand our responsibility in this. So would you join me as I lead us in a time of prayer? Father, I want to thank you for your sovereignty over all the earth. Nothing has happened this past week or this past month or from this, the time this world was spoken into existence 
that you have not overseen and ordained. Lord, you are in charge of everything in the future and you are working all things out to their rightful end. And we thank you for your sovereignty. We praise you for your humility and not just holding back what you were doing in this world, but by actually revealing yourself through nature, but more especially through your word. And we thank you for giving us direction. But most importantly, we thank you for showing us who you are through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his humility in coming to this earth. We confess that we are all sinners. Many of us, the members of this church, have confessed our sin and we've turned to you for salvation and we thank you for that. We confess even before we start this service that many of us have maybe fallen into sin or gone the wrong way. And Lord, even today as we begin this service, we ask for your forgiveness. We know that you did when we turned to you, forgave us of all of our sin, but we come asking for once again that fellowship to be renewed. And then we thank you for that forgiveness that you give. We thank you for showing the glory of your, your greatness through your son, Jesus. We thank you how in 1836 you started this group of believers that have been worshiping here for over 180 years. And we thank you for the perseverance and the, for, for the protection that you've given to this church. And now, Father, we ask that in this service that Christ would be magnified in everything that we do. That we would see again the gospel message that opened our eyes to Jesus. May we see it anew and see the importance of it. May you give us wisdom as we decide to set apart for gospel work. And then finally, would you help us all to submit our lives to you to declare your name among the nations. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. Let's all stand together. We're going to begin by singing, May the peoples praise you. May all the nations declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's sing together. You have called us out of darkest night into your glorious light that we may sing the wonders of the risen Christ. May our every breath retell the grace that broke into our strife with boundless love and It's yours and all within each harvest is your own and from your hand we give to you to make christ known may the seeds of mercy grow in us for those who have not heard may songs of praise build lives of grace to spread It's our holy privilege to declare your praises and your name to every nation, tribe, 
Our desire as the church that that the nations those who are blinded to God's glory would see him as we present Jesus to them let's sing together be unto your name we are a moment you are forever Lord of the ages God before time Eternal, love everlasting, reigning on high. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Highest praises, honor, and glory. Be is completely worthy of all of our praise. He's worthy of our heart's affections. He's worthy of all of our sacrifice. As we think of his worth and look at our lives, what can we give a God who is worthy? We can say, Lord, take my life. Let it be consecrated. Let it be used to spread your fame throughout all the nations. Take my life and let it be consecrated. 
I hope that that's your prayer, that each and every day you would consecrate your life to the Lord Jesus Christ to be used for him and for his glory. And that happens uh, throughout the mundane events of our life. Every decision that we make can be offered up as an act of worship as we submit our lives to him. So I pray that that will not be just a song we sing together every now and then on a Sunday, but it would be a prayer of our heart each and every morning as we move throughout our day. Lord, here's, here's everything about me. I want it to be used in service to you and for your glory. Uh, back in February of 2016, God began to work in the heart of, uh, regarding uh, not just an everyday consecration of their life, but uh, regarding, uh, you could say in many ways, um, adjusting every aspect of their life to take the gospel to the people. Uh, over the last number of years, there's been conversations with our pastoral team um, assessments through uh, Paul Sager and the Ministry of Biblical Ministries Worldwide, uh, taking a survey trip to the country, and uh, they set their sights on gospel ministry. Now, last year, our church voted to take them on as missionaries and uh, to support them on a monthly basis. And of course, um, since they are some of our own members, uh, we've had pretty much a, a vested interest in this journey. And over the last uh, year or so, the nature and the focus of their ministry has morphed um, to become more focused on evangelism, discipleship, leading a church planting team. Uh, who knows what God has for that in the future, maybe even training uh, national pastors there. And so as pastors, we have felt uh, because of the nature and the direction of the ministry, uh, we felt uh, the need to be increasing the training and the accountability for uh, through this. Many of you have experienced the blessing of the gift and the gifts that has been given. Uh, he's been involved in teaching several adult life stage classes. He's led Bible studies over the last number of years. Over the last number of months, uh, it's actually submitted to a doctrinal evaluation for the sake of theological accountability with our church family. And this last Friday, uh, he sat through an examination where he provided a defense of biblical doctrine and a thorough support and explanation of our statement of faith as a church. And so this morning, uh, it's with great honor, I have the privilege to announce that the pastors of Lebanon Baptist Church recommend to the members of this congregation 
that we officially affirm and authorize the gospel ministry. Um, the ushers are passing out these forms now. And uh, as I said, we did, take, we did vote as a congregation to take uh, this on for monthly mission support. But this is a special opportunity for our church. Um, as a congregation, we're affirming this recommendation from the ordination council that he is in fact gifted and he is qualified and we want to officially authorize and set him apart for gospel ministry in this way. And so um, as, as you uh, receive uh, one of these forms, uh, this is for all of the members of Lebanon Baptist Church, 18 and older, uh, to be able to affirm this. And this is just an uh, official way for our congregation to set him apart in this way. And so if you'll take a moment to fill that form out, and in just a moment, our ushers will come to receive our morning offering. And uh, if you'll take that form and just drop that in the offering plate, and uh, Lord willing, in a few moments after our uh, message, we'll have the opportunity to affirm these things together. Um, but this is, a, this is a significant moment, an opportunity for our church to be able to set apart in this way and uh, I want to say from the pastors, this is truly an honor and a privilege uh, to see this happening within our congregation. Were each of our members able to get one of those? If you were not, if you'll just slip your hand up and our ushers can get one to you. Again, in just a moment, the ushers will come and they will pass the plates, offering plates, and you can drop the, the form in the offering plate as it comes by. Would you pray with me this morning? Our Father in heaven, we as we have been singing this morning, want to declare your glory together this morning, that you, you are worthy to receive honor and glory and power. You've created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Today we meet together as a church family to celebrate the reality that you alone are worthy of worship. Lord, we recognize the reality, even as Pastor Brian prayed, that over 180 years ago, you established and authorized this assembly uh, to take the good news of what you have done to reconcile all people to yourself, to this world, to this community, and even to the nations. Father, help us to be faithful as a church to this mission, to declare your glory among all people. Lord, would you continue to increase our passion that your name would be glorified, that people would come to give their lives to Jesus. Lord, I, increase our burden to see people give Jesus his rightful place as Lord of their life, that they would acknowledge his proper worth as the one and only God. Strengthen us, I pray, to be faithful ambassadors of you. Lord, I, we confess this morning that even though we've come to faith in Jesus and have entrusted our lives to you, we've come through a week where we have been tempted to offer worship to false gods. Honestly, Lord, we have pursued our own way. We've sought satisfaction and joy in everything but you, Father. And so we ask for your forgiveness. We thank you that in your kindness, you've brought us back together today so that we could be reminded that you alone are our source of hope and joy. You alone are worthy of consecrating our lives to. And Father, remind us now as we go into this week that we have been created by you and for you. And so our prayer today is, as we just sang, that you would take our life let it be consecrated only, Lord, to thee. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. At this time, as the ushers come down to collect both our offering and our ballots, we'd like to introduce to you a new hymn, a hymn that we would like to teach now so we can be prepared for the upcoming missions conference in just a couple of weeks. The name of this hymn is called For the Cause, and you can find the music to it in your bulletin. And so we'd like to teach it to you as a worship team, and then we'll ask you to join us. Here's the song, For the Cause. For the cause of Christ the King, we give our lives an offering till all 
the earth resounds with ceaseless praise to the Son. For the cause of Christ we go with joy to reap, with faith to sow, as many see and many put their trust in the Son. Christ we proclaim the name above every name for all creation every nation God's salvation through the Son Now would you join us and sing together For the cause of Christ the King we give our lives an offering till all the earth resounds with ceaseless praise to the sun for the cause of christ we go with joy to reap with faith to sow as many see and many put their trust in the sun christ we proclaim the name above every name for all creation every nation god's salvation through the sun stand with us now and sing for the king once lifted high to cries of rage of crucified endured the cross as every sin was laid on the sun to the king who conquered death to free the poor and the oppressed for lasting peace for life and liberty in the sun christ we proclaim the name above every name for all creation every nation god's salvation through the sun let it be my life's refrain to live is christ to die is gain deny myself take up my cross and follow the sun Let's sing that again let it be my life's refrain to live is christ to die is gain deny myself take up my cross and follow the sun christ we proclaim the name above every name for all creation every nation god's salvation through the sun christ we proclaim the name above every name for all creation every nation God's salvation through the sun. Great singing. At this time, we'd like to dismiss our children out the back doors, K-4 through second grade. And parents, if you're new to our church, you can pick up your children at the conclusion of our service right down this hallway. The scriptures tell us to hold fast to the word of the gospel, the word of faith. As we go out we want to be faithful to that, to present it as it should be presented. The scriptures tell us to hold fast, but at the same time, it gives us a wonderful promise that no matter where we are or where we go, whether it's into our neighborhoods, into our families who may be hostile towards this good news, or perhaps even to the uttermost parts of the earth, perhaps to Indonesia, we have this wonderful promise that as we hold fast to the gospel, God holds fast to us. And he will never leave us nor forsake us. And I'm convinced that what he has begun in us, he will complete until the day of Jesus Christ. So let us sing together.
of this wonderful truth. He will hold me fast. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, He will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, he must hold me fast. He will hold me fast, he will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. he saves are his delight Christ will hold me fast precious in his holy sight he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last but has been satisfied he will hold me fast raised with him to endless life he will hold me fast till our faith is turned to sight when he comes at last This morning, uh, due to the significance of this occasion, I am going to do something a little bit out of sequence when it comes to my preaching. Of course, I have been preaching through the first letter to the Corinthians. And we, if at this point, have come to the second half of 1 Corinthians 14, which really talks about order needed within worship gatherings. I didn't see the appropriateness of that text on this special occasion. However, in 1 Corinthians 15 is a very applicable text. So I've chosen this morning to examine 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 11. We'll do that today and then return to 1 Corinthians 14 next week. And so this morning, let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 15, 
And as a reminder, uh, this is the word of God. Let me read it to you. Now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the, the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached and you believed. This morning, we are approaching, as you can tell, the end of this letter. You have 1 Corinthians 1 through 16. We are almost at the end. Hopefully, we will end this particular series by the end of March. For those of you who are visiting today, let me uh, take a moment to orient you to where we are in this letter. This particular letter, 1 Corinthians, was written by a first century Jew by the name of Paul. And we believe it was written under the inspiration of God, which is what you are reading today is what God actually instructed and told Paul to write. Paul had seen the risen Christ when he appeared to him on the road to Damascus. And he appointed this man to be an apostle to the Gentiles, which are those who were non-Jews. And it was on Paul's second missionary journey that Paul went to a city in now modern day Greece, but there in ancient Greece by the, the name of Corinth. This was many ways like the Las Vegas of our day. He came there and he preached the gospel and a local church was started. Now, many months later, this young church needed instruction and 1 Corinthians was the letter written to correct some of the problems that were going on in that church as well as to answer questions that they had. The main thrust of this particular letter was to teach this church to think right about the gospel of Jesus and to live their lives according to the gospel. Here in 1 Corinthians 15, where we approach this morning, there is one final problem that needs to be addressed. In fact, it is a paramount problem. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 11 is simply the setup to the correction that will take place all through 1 Corinthians 15. Paul doesn't state the problem explicitly until verse 12, a verse that I hadn't read up to this point. But let me read it to you now. It says this, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Evidently, there were some people within this church that were denying the resurrection. Now, they may not have been explicitly denying that Jesus Christ had resurrected, but they were just denying resurrection in general. It was almost as if Let's say this year, let's say someone in our church denied that the people who in our assembly passed away this past year that we buried, 
They denied that they would ever, those bodies that we buried into the ground, that they would ever be used or resurrected again. No doubt this, these people in this culture was influenced by the Greek philosophical worldview of that day that saw the immortality of the soul. Souls live forever, but no resurrection body. The body is to be discarded, never to be used again. You know what? We are, and even in this culture, up against this. Even some today believe the body of people is just done away with. Of course, there's been a great rise in the use of cremation. Many people who uh, move in that direction, sometimes they say, now throw my ashes everywhere because they're never going to be used again. It's done away with. The body is done. I've abandoned it. There was a problem here. This was a devastating departure that ultimately, if it was not corrected in this church, would sink the entire ship of Christianity. So before Paul explicitly corrects them through the rest of 1 Corinthians 15, he reminds them of the essential elements of the gospel. In fact, our text opens with this. I would remind you, literally he says this, let me make known to you. It was almost as if there were some people in the church who were kind of the smarty pantses. They were the know-it-alls, we got it all figured out, who were possibly getting a little bit too big for their britches. And he says, I need to make sure you, I need to make known to you something. It was almost like, Remember Vince Lombardi at one point got in front of the Green Bay Packers and reminded them, this is a football? It was like, okay, here are these guys who've given their life for that leather ball. But he had to remind them, guys, this is a football, and let's get back to the basics. You must make sure you know and that you hold tight to the gospel. And that's the theme of this text. That's the theme of my message this morning. It's simply this, hold fast to the gospel. It's expressed in that phrase at the end of verse 2. Let me read verse, uh, let me read verse 2 to you. For by which you are being saved, if you, here it is, hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. So if you're going to underline anything, that's the point. He wants you to hold fast to this. It's also emphasized when he tells you how it's a priority when he says in verse 3, for I delivered unto you of what? First importance. You know what? All your Bible is important and you need to obey it all. But there are some things that are stated so often or so integral to the the foundation of the gospel, you cannot let go. Otherwise, it's gone. Paul is saying, remember what I gave you. Remember when I came there, what I preached to you. And he reminds the Corinthians of the centrality of the gospel to the Christian faith. Now, by gospel, those of you who may be visiting today, what I mean is the good news of Jesus Christ. That term gospel had been used even in the Old Testament. It was used in reference to the promised return of Israel when they went into exile. And they're being told of good news that's coming to them. But ultimately it was of the new creation and how everything would be brought back into order. Ultimately the gospel would be finally realized in Messiah, which is Jesus Christ. The gospel contains the basic elements that an individual must embrace to be a biblical Christian. Have you embraced these essential truths? You and I live in 2020 in the buckle of the Bible belt where many people claim to be Christians. 
We live in a society, what I would call cultural Christianity. But the question is, are you a biblical Christian? And just so you know, even the cultural Christianity that you and I live in is diminishing. And it is vital that those of us who truly believe in the gospel, that we hold fast to it. The day is coming, and I'm telling you it's coming quicker than you think, that persecution will reveal who are real and who are not real. And we need to be extremely aware of even the slightest departure from the gospel, even within our midst. Have you embraced the gospel And are you, if you have, holding fast to the gospel? And today I want to give you two simple keys to holding fast to the gospel. And the first is simply this. Remember the essential elements of the gospel. And when I say remember them, I mean you need to rehearse them. They need to be your life, okay? And beginning in verse 3 of our text... Paul gives the essential elements of the gospel. Look what he says in verse 3. He says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. You say the first element of the gospel, what is it, Pastor Brian? It's this, Christ, Jesus Christ, died for our sins. This speaks of Jesus Christ, who was, as we know, the Messiah, the Christ, which means the anointed one. What did he do? He actually died, but that's not it. That's not all. He died for our sins. What this does is this speaks of a theological, you could say, analogy that we call Penal substitution. It was where Christ was penalized on a cross on behalf of sinners. He paid the penalty that you and I deserved. In fact, we know of penalties today. In fact, in the midst of football season, here's my second analogy of football. There's oftentimes penalties, and one of the heftiest penalties is targeting. In fact, if you target someone in a football game by placing your helmet, going helmet to helmet, you can be, number one, penalized 15 yards, but you can also be ejected from the game. And if you get that particular penalty, you have to pay for it. You can't say, oh, let's get that scrub on uh, special teams I'll just pass it off to him. No, if you did it, you're responsible and you're out of the game. Penalties in football are bad for your team. But let me tell you, penalties with sin are a whole lot more horrific. And all of you are guilty of it. And you and I have to pay for it ourselves unless God changes things. God made a way for you to have your penalty paid by another. That is one of the essential elements of the gospel. You must understand that you individually, as of every other human being that has ever been brought onto this planet, you need to understand that you were estranged from God because of your sin. But Jesus was God's plan to redeem you. In fact, Paul opened this letter by concentrating on this aspect. It's interesting how he opens the letter of 1 Corinthians by emphasizing the cross. He closes 1 Corinthians by emphasizing the resurrection. He packs it all in here and he defends it. In fact, he talks about the cross and how it's that that saves people. Listen to what he says at the beginning of 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians 1, it says this. For the word of the cross, the message of the cross, is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. You say, what does that mean? It says this. To the world, to those 
who don't believe in the cross, they look at the cross and how God, the creator of the universe, would take on a human body and die on a Roman cross and be shed to be a substitute for sinners. You know what they look at that? They think it's foolishness. Literally, the word there is moronic. They think that's for morons. But to those of us, those of us who believe it, it is God's power. God demonstrated his ultimate power by sending his son on a cross. And I'll tell you, that doctrine right there is attacked. Now, it may not sometimes be blatantly attacked, but they start eating away at the foundation of it through attacking man's sinfulness. You're not that bad. In fact, you're pretty good. Our world does that so that you won't think you need a savior. Or they'll tell you, you know what, hell, a literal hell where there's fire and brimstone. <laughs> I don't know about that. And they begin to deny that. So what it does is say, do I really need this? Do I need the gospel? Or possibly the wrath of God. Is God really angry? Is his disposition angry at sinners? Notice that his death, Jesus, this whole gospel, this death was according to the scriptures. Do you know that God's death on the cross, Jesus, it was all planned from eternity past. In fact, before Jesus came, it was referenced, referenced all through the Old Testament of what he would even do in being the sinless substitute. In fact, the Old Testament, which are the 39 books that precede the New Testament, they were written all before Jesus Christ came, but they prophesied of one who would one day die. In fact, let me give you one of the clearest ones. Isaiah 53. This was written 700 years before Jesus Think about this. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Is that not penal substitution? 700 years before Jesus came, he told us it's coming. It's coming. And that's why Paul says this is in accordance with the scriptures. This is what was told. Now the reality of Jesus' death was authenticated by the next term in our text. Look at what it says again in verse 4. It says, and he was buried. You say, why did Paul include that? Well, he included that to show that the entombment shows the fact that he actually died. You can read about his entombment and all the gospel messages. He died and he was buried. Which brings us, what I would believe, to the second element of the gospel, and it's this. Christ rose from the dead. Look what it says at the end of verse 4. And he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. You know what? He was raised from the dead. Also, it says, in accordance to the scriptures, do you know that it was already told before he came and alluded to that he would rise? In fact, in Psalm chapter 16, which is a messianic psalm, it says this, for you will not abandon my soul in Sheol, which means you will not abandon my soul in the grave. But then he says this, or let your holy one see what? Corruption. He was saying, you know what? This person's, God's gonna do something here. Jesus resurrected. And I'll tell you this, it's because he resurrected, we have hope. You and I have hope to see our loved ones who preceded us in Christ. We have something that we can look forward to. He overcame the grave. He authenticated this, and what Paul does is he lists all those, or I wouldn't say all, a selective group of people that he, Jesus, appeared to. And this was basically to authenticate that he rose, he also appeared. 
beginning in verse 5, it says this, and he appeared to Cephas. Now, who was this? Cephas is Peter's name in Aramaic. If you didn't know, Aramaic was the common, you could say, language that they spoke. Greek was more of the commercial language of that day. But here we're given Peter's Aramaic name. The 12, it says in verse 5, it says, Then he appeared to the 12. This refers to the disciples, of course, minus Judas, possibly already including Matthias, who was brought into the disciple number. And then it says in verse 6, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Evidently, this was a large group that could have been the Great Commission. So if you read the Great Commission at the end of Matthew chapter 25, and you kind of understand the situation, there were other people there. This could have been this, the situation where 500 people saw him. He also refers to some who had died as simply fallen what? Fallen asleep. You know what that is? That's a beautiful imagery that God is not done with them yet. Of course, what do we know from other texts of scripture? When a person dies who knows the Lord, they, their souls are immediately with the Lord. But their bodies are still important. You know what, this past Tuesday, I visited the Georgia National Cemetery. And I was reminded of numbers of our church, who I like to call planted there. Their seeds have been planted. In fact, I went to visit one of them that was buried just about a month ago, wondering if they had put his tombstone up. And as I got to his particular site, probably 10 to 20 men were working installing tombstones in there. And one of them shouted, just give the guy a moment. He's, he's coming to see. Uh, and I said, it's okay. It, it's, it's okay. But then I, all of a sudden, the spirit prompted me. You could say, and I said, hey, guys, just want to tell you something. This guy right here, he's with the Lord. And this body one day. God has promised that he's going to resurrect this body. And that body will be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Some of them, of course, you could tell they, they may have known the Lord and they're nodding their heads. You know what the world calls those people? They call them dead. And we sometimes refer to them as dead. We know they're with Jesus, but I'll tell you this, their bodies are simply asleep. Paul continues with witnesses. He says in verse 7, he says this, Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. You know, who was this James? James was almost certainly Jesus' half-brother who didn't believe in Jesus as the Messiah, but who ultimately came to believe and who ultimately led the church after Jesus' resurrection. The apostles included, no doubt, the disciples, but some commissioned by Jesus as well. Paul ends with Jesus' appearance to him. Listen to what he says in verse 8. He says this, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. It's interesting, the language that Paul uses here is very descriptive. He says this, As one who was untimely born. It meant this, I was abnormally born. Or I was kind of the miscarriage. What Paul saw himself as was as one born to apostleship suddenly, unexpectedly, and abnormally. A miscarriage happens abnormally, not at the right time. And he says, I was the miscarriage. I was totally out of time. Paul uses this term to highlight God's grace. And his power. Paul was overwhelmed at God's grace to him. In fact, it's emphasized in the next two verses. Listen to what it says in verse 9 and 10. He says, for I am the least of the apostles. Unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. Though it was not I but the grace of God that was with me. 
What does he do? He calls himself the least of the apostles. Why? Because he said he persecuted the church. But God's grace did something amazing in transforming him. Then you see how three times in that little two verses, he refers to what? The grace of God. The grace of God. You say, Pastor Brian, what is the gospel? The gospel is very simple. It's this. It is Jesus' substitutionary death and bodily resurrection that pours grace on undeserving sinners to give them eternal purpose. And that church that he's writing to needed to be reminded of it. And guess what? So do you. You need to be reminded of all the time. My question to you this morning is this. Do you embrace the elements of the gospel? Have you at some point in your life believed those have happened for your sake? If not, you are outside of Christ. You're not a biblical Christian. If you have believed in those, do you continually remind yourself of those truths? We've been teaching even one ways to express this through these uh, four little pictures and kind of what we, we nicknamed at the beginning, napkin theology, how you can write it out. You need to remind yourself of the gospel. You need to know these things. And what Paul does right before he addresses this whole problem, he says, let me remind you of the gospel. Know this. It's almost like, you know, when I leave the house, I have like these three pats, wallet, phone, keys. Anyone do that too? You just like check, make sure, do I have all these? Because if I get down the day and I don't have all three of them, I'm going to be in trouble. Let me tell you, those are important, but not nearly as important as the three pats when it comes to the gospel. Do you know the gospel? And you know what you need to do every day is you need to remind yourself Christ died for my sins. He saw victory over my sins. He raised from the dead, and I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So you know what? When it comes to my relationships with my kids, my example in, as a coworker, at my line of work, as I interact with my spouse and deal with situations that come up, my first priority is to remind myself of the gospel. What has this done for me that has transformed me? It goes against bitterness. It goes against all the different trials you have in your life. And even if you remind yourself, let's say you have a debilitating disease, you will be restored one day. You can trust that. It gives you hope. That's why he says, I make known unto you the gospel. Don't let a piece of it out. That All this brings us to our second key. You need to remember the gospel, but the final thing I want to give you this morning is you need to follow the proper responses to the gospel. You say, what are these, Pastor Brian? When a person truly knows the gospel, when you've learned it, when someone has told it to you, he calls you to respond properly to it. And this, in this text, he tells us the proper response. And the first is this, it must be received. You've got to receive it. Look what it says in verse 2. It says, uh, or excuse me, uh, verse 1, it says, And now I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you what? Received. This is also in verse 3, for I delivered unto you of first importance what I also, what? Received. The Corinthians received it, Paul received it, and you need to receive it. In fact, the, a synonym of this is illustrated in the term in verse 11, which says this, whether then it is I or they, so we preach, and you what? Believed. So what does it mean to receive? It means you believe it, you depend it, you welcome it into your life. Have you done that? Have you welcomed those truths into your life? When Jesus initially came to this planet and he, get, he showed himself to the Israeli nation, 
What did the Bible say about their receiving of him? Listen to what it says in John chapter 1. He came into his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed on his name, there are those two terms together. He gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood. This is not a blood thing. Nor of the will of the flesh. This is not something that you just do on your own. Nor the will of man. It's not you. If you receive him, it is a work of God on your behalf. You must receive him. You must welcome him into your house. It's almost like this. There's been times as a a family that we have welcomed guests. We have a guest room at our house. And there are times that people have stayed in our guest room and we welcome them in as as guests. That's one kind of welcome. It's kind of like the temporary welcome. Come for a little while. This is not what it means to come to Christ. When you welcome Jesus Christ in, what sweet does he get? He gets the master. And he's not coming for a little bit. Have you invited him to not simply come and dine with you, but to come and take over again? You were created to live with him as the master. You have welcomed him in. I remember for me, I believe that happened around the age of 16 where I was living for myself. And when I finally said, God, come in. I want you. You're more important than anything else. And I turned from my own way and I trusted Jesus Christ. You need to welcome him in as a permanent master. The second response is simple. It's this. This gospel, it must be stood upon. Listen to what it says at the end of verse 1. It says, which you received, in which you stand. Literally, the verb tense here means we have taken our stand and are continuing to stand on it. Now, I may be right at this very moment standing on this platform. But I'll tell you, it was around the age of 16 that I took my stand on Jesus Christ. He was my foundation, for there is none other foundation than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And I placed my stand on him, and ever since that day, I have stood on him. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. It needs to be received. It needs to be stood upon. And as a result, what does it do? Look at the beginning of verse 2. And by which you are being saved. You say, what does that mean? It means this. That is a phrase. Now, those of you who are looking at it in the English, sometimes if you were to look at it in the original language, the tenses that you can tell have specific meaning. And this particular tense is in a passive tense, which means this, it's being done to you. It is the gospel, Jesus, that is actually saving you. He is the one who is saving you. We talk about being saved. Like I referred back to like when I was 16. There was a point where I was justified and declared righteous before God. He was my sinless substitute. But this idea that he's talking about here is not simply something that was done in the past. This is something that is active. He is in the midst of saving me. Now we know the Bible also says those who he justifies, he will glorify. He will finish the job. But this in-between time, you know what he's doing? Because I've depended on Jesus, he is saving me right now. From all that I'm going through, he is my salvation. That's why the life that he now gives is not simply life. He gives you abundant life because you are already on the transport vehicle that's bringing you home. It's almost like that I've been placed on a moving ship. The ship is moving. 
I'm standing stationary. I've taken my stand. And I'm in the midst of being brought home. And there's no question of whether the ship's going to get there. It's going to get there. Now, one problem that some of us have is that we sometimes think that that's not enough. Jesus isn't enough. It's almost like we've got rescued from our deserted island and we're on the Coast Guard ship. They're saving us. We're like, oh, you're so worried the whole time. You run into, I've got to save us. And maybe you're trying to take over the, the reins or trying to earn or, or pay them for all of this. If you are trying to work out your own salvation on your own and trying to merit it, let me tell you, you can't do it. Salvation is where you finally take your stand on Jesus and you say enough is enough. And there's a lot of people who say, you know what, Jesus is good, but you know what, I'm, I'm going to have to do this, 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 this. And then he's going to save me. No, he saves you. And the reason I do this, 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 and this is not to merit his salvation. It's because he saved me and he's changing me and I want to do those things. That's the difference. My works are not saving me, but authenticating that Jesus is saving me. So that's two. It needs to be received. It needs to be stood upon, but it also must be preached. Paul tells them that this is what he preached when he came to them. This is what, when I got to you and I got to Corinth and I arrived on the scene, this is what I was doing. In fact, we can read of the reception of this church in Acts chapter 18. I referred to when he arrived in Corinth. This is what he did when he got there. It says this, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and he tried to persuade Jews and Greeks Now, when two of his buddies came, when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, which is the northern part of Greece, Paul was occupied with the word. What that means is this. He was busy telling people about the scriptures and what they meant, testifying to the Jews that the Christ, the Messiah, was Jesus. Not only was Paul doing this, but others were doing this. Go back to verse 11. It says this, whether then it is I or they, so, and it's interesting, at the end of the text, he says, now we preach. He says, we, and and literally, it's not saying like we just do this one time. It's this, we are continually preaching Christ. This is to be an active thing. We all preach and herald Christ. Did you know the good news is something that you and I are not to save and put into our safety deposit box? The good news is something that you and I are to announce. We announce babies. We send out our little cards that announce things on Facebook, on social media. We announce graduations. We announce weddings. But if there's anything that you and I ought to announce, it's the good news of the gospel. That's what we're called to do. Where are you at? Where are you guys at? Right there. I want to say this to you. This is the good news that you get to share. Proclaim it with all your might. Give your heart to it. Share the full gospel of Christ. But all of you, this is not simply for our missionaries to do. All who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good must share that's why we've developed a whole program that you can jump on your, our website and learn what it means to love your neighbor. And loving your neighbor is simply just not loving them, but there's getting to know them, serving them. But ultimately, one of the ways that you show them love is by sharing the message of the gospel. This is an aspect that we're to remind believers about. So when we go back to the point here, it says it is to be preached It is to be preached again and again. That means this. If you are a believer in Christ, you know what you're always doing? You're preaching the gospel, not just to unsaved people. You know who I'm supposed to preach the gospel to? To save people. You remember when Paul writes to the Romans, he says, I'm ready now to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome. And he's writing to a church. Why is he saying, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you? Didn't they already have the gospel, Pastor Brian? No, they had the gospel, but they needed to continually hear it. Because it is the gospel, if you remind yourself of it, is what changes you 
and applies to every situation in your life. Most of my counseling here, okay, all, I can just say all of my counseling, whether it's just, you could say, across my desk or over a cup of coffee, do you know what it all is? It's all bringing them back to the gospel and how if you think right about it and you realize the implications of what Jesus did, it radically changes forgiveness. And if you're dealing with bitterness, it radically changes how you deal with sicknesses and how you cope with them. If you have a marriage relationship where you're not getting along and there's problems, did you know the answer is ultimately found in the message of the gospel and what he's done and you living out that? The gospel, our lives flow from this good news. And that's why we have to be incredibly careful to do the last here. This brings us to the theme of our text, one final response, and it's this. It must be held fast. We will see that there were some denying aspects of the gospel. We're going to see that. Paul tells them, this church that they need to hold fast to it. The term here, let me read it to you, verse two. And by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preach to you. That term means that you persevere in it. But he also gives a warning. It's very interesting. Some of you are like, what is he doing here? He says this, unless you believed in vain. You say, what does that mean? I believe it's saying this, unless you never genuinely believed in the first place. You remember the parable of the soils? Where the sower goes and tosses seeds, and it looks like some of these are sprouting up, but some fell on the pathway, and they sprouted for a little bit, but of course the sun baked them. Some grew up in thorns, and the thorns choked them. And some the birds took. What were the genuine ones? The ones who bared what? Fruit. What I'm saying here is this. There are those who seem to receive the word, but the seed didn't take root. We saw this as well in our series in the Gospel of John in John chapter 2. When Jesus is ministering. And it says at the end of John chapter 2 that many believed on him when they saw the miracles in which he did. But literally it says this, but Jesus did not believe in them. He didn't believe on them because he knew what was in man. What this is saying is this. True faith will hold fast. But he gives you a warning So you will hold fast. That's what he does in Colossians chapter 1 verse 23. He says this, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel, which you heard, which is proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. Let me tell you, true believers will hold fast to the gospel. And to bring this with the song we sang right before the message, which I would say is purposeful. Behind you holding fast to the gospel is Jesus holding fast to you. And those who have truly come to know him, he will hold you fast. But he does tell you to hold fast to it, to persevere in it. So what does that mean for you and me today? means simply this, you need to be reminding yourself of the gospel. How do I do that? The word. You need to allow the word to take root. If I was to walk up to you before the service today and I was to say to you, hey, who saw the risen Christ? Would you have said, oh yeah, Cephas did. Some of you made, hey, Mary Magdalene did. Would some of you have said, oh, did you know that 500 people saw him at one time? Did you know that James, the half-brother, did? Did you know that Paul did? You know what you need to do? You need to grow in the gospel. Know why it's important. 
keep filling your mind with it. I've, I've suggested there's a book called The Gospel Primer. It's just the guy wrote a number of devotionals that just reminds you of elements of the gospel. It's a beautiful book. Get that and remind yourself of it. But then also I would say this, defend the gospel. When it is denied in some way and it's in your presence, you ought to speak up. We have freedom to do that, don't we? If someone is denying that, even in your workplace, and you have some freedom, could you not take them aside? And you know, the, what I believe, according to what the Bible says, is this. Have you ever thought about this? Give the word of testimony. You know what, if it's on a show and all of a sudden you're watching something and they're denying something that eats at the gospel, correct it. When you're done, say, kids, I want you to make sure that you understand this. This is, this is not the case here. This is a denial of this. And then let me just say, I don't think it, this is not going to surprise any of you, but recognize in our culture that there are tons of philosophies that chisel away at the integrity of the gospel. Don't be, oh, be like a bulldog. I'm going to protect this. And then finally, Share this message with your mouth. Lebanon Baptist Church, we get to send some of our own to take this message of the gospel. What a privilege for that. We're getting to do what the church at Antioch did by sending Paul. And you know what? Corinth was a result of a church sending their own to be established. May God help us as we send and let us pray for them. But you know what? Let us join them in our public proclamation of remembering the gospel and following what it tells us to do. Let's pray.